Will you join me now in this call to worship? We have come to this holy place to worship our God, yet sanctuary is not always built by human hands. Everywhere I go is a sanctuary, every place a time to worship God. When we live as if this planet and all creation, even ourselves, is a sanctuary, a holy place full of the Creator's presence, we walk differently upon this earth. I am always on sacred ground. I must move with reverence through all creation, and I enter this holy place now to worship the Creator. let's join together in our opening prayer. Most wonderful God, foolish and flawed though we are, we too delight in your beloved Son. As in his name we gather in the house of many praises, may the heavens be opened for us, that we may catch a glimpse of that light and love that transforms our common days with a beauty not of our making. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our scripture today uh, comes from the book of Ephesians, uh, one of Paul's most well-known passages. It's known as the, pass the whole armor of God from uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And Erica Yardy is going to read that passage for us now. Good morning, Erica. Good morning. The scripture reading is taken from Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you may be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given 
to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Parents to scripture reading. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we are grateful for the ways in which you come to us to equip us and empower us to face the challenges of this life. From the storms that bring rain and wind to the storms that bring heartache and troubles. We trust in you through all life seasons. Bless us now during this time of preaching too, that we might hear your word, that we might receive it, and that we might be doers of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Flight attendants are flocking to self-defense classes as 2021 unruly passenger fines top $1 million. Food workers speak out about confrontations during the pandemic. Ongoing pandemic takes toll on workers' mental health. The coronavirus has made me a rage monster. Help. These are all some of the headlines that I found just doing a quick little search this week uh, about mental health and issues around anger and frustration. Uh, during the pandemic. And certainly there are hundreds, thousands more of headlines like these. They surround us, don't they? And they describe the present reality of everyday life for so many. Our friends, our families, our coworkers, and our neighbors are on edge. And so are we. And we're often taking out our anxieties and frustrations on one another. Our faith seeks to help us navigate these challenging times. From pursuing virtues and practicing gratitude to finding a quiet center or something that we just love and enjoy, something that can help us stay balanced and, and understanding too that we both need to give and receive forgiveness and patience when we stumble. We have tools, we have God-given tools at our disposal. We have God's good gifts. We have Jesus to help us through these tough times. Now, although the Christians living in ancient Ephesus face challenges that are not, uh, not our own, and I uh, am quite sure that in many ways, the challenges they faced were, were very different than what, go, what we're going through. The teaching that St. Paul offered to them, though, is incredibly relevant to our experience. You see, throughout Paul's letter to that church, we find references to and allusions to hostilities and animosities, anxieties that existed among that church's membership. Divisions that were perhaps rooted in tradition or even ethnicity, more so than any pandemic, but they were divisions nonetheless. And while it's easy when we uh, read the scripture to, to perhaps get lost, or if you've studied the scripture heavily, I know one of my temptations is to see things through the lens of like, oh, Roman oppression, or the, uh, the differences brought about between, between those who were raised Jewish and those who were raised Gentile, and, and how that caused conflict. We can think of those macro level sources of conflict, sure. But isn't it also quite probable that there were just people in that community and in that church and in that city who annoyed each other, who got under each other's skin, who just got tired of dealing with each other and snapped at each other and, and talked behind one another's backs and, and just fed into a, a, a system that, 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 that tore down and, and weren't there rage monsters in ancient Ephesus too? I think undoubtedly there were. And I can imagine someone in their own way, reaching out to Paul to confess, these people are making me rage monsters, St. Paul. Help me, help me get through this. Well, Paul, of course, wanted his church, one of those Ephesians, to realize that through Jesus, they could receive the courage and the wisdom and the strength that they needed to overcome whatever they faced, whether it, rather it, whether it was 
Rome's oppression or whether it was uh, the divisions that existed because of how people were brought up and how they were raised, or whether was it just the way that those annoyances and animosities festered in their lives. A passage at the first chapter, from the first chapter of Ephesians, give us a sense of what Paul was dealing with there and, and, and how he was trying to address it. This is what he wrote. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, Christ may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love, strengthened in your inner being, rooted and grounded in love. Whatever was going on, that seems like advice, that seems like a teaching that, that might be applicable to us as well. And he continued, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, rooted, grounded, strengthened in your inner building, being filled with God's love, reminded of coming to a deeper understanding of God's love for you, so that you might be better able to love one another. That's the power, that's the, that's the angle, that's the wisdom that St. Paul is delivering to that church and to us too. And it's worth our time then to take a closer look at the scripture that Eric has read for us this morning, that famous passage about the whole armor of God. It's all connected here in this book of Ephesians. But first we need to set the stage for what exactly we're dealing with. And I think as we dig a little bit deeper into the story of that place, of that church, we find even more and more touchstones and connections between that ancient place and our own experience. Ephesus, you see, was a, a city, it would be today in the modern nation of Turkey. And it rose to great prominence during the Roman era, really beca becoming that area's first city. Almost half a million people called Ephesians home. And it was a commercial and religious, it's commercial and religious points of interest ensured a steady stream of immigrants and pilgrims and visitors. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in that place, a temple to the goddess Artemis. That temple could hold 25,000 worshipers. There was also a great theater in that city where classic works of drama were performed, where gladiators uh, did their death matches. In fact, that theater is still standing to this day. And that prominent city also had a prominent church. Paul, St. John, Mary, the mother of Jesus. These are some of the illuminaries of that first generation of Christians who, who have a connection to that city. So you have this grandiose place full of, of powerful people. Rome's presence is great there. The church's presence is great there. And then there are just a lot of people in that place. Are you seeing some of the potential for frustrations and conflict that must have existed on the streets of that city, in the marketplace of that city, in the temples and churches and theaters and coliseums of that place? Put 500,000 people together in one city, and I think undoubtedly you're going to have conflict. You're going to have rage monsters running wild throughout the place. Well, given that mix, given the, the powers, the forces that were at play in that place, um, it, it, it's quite clear that Paul seeks, you know, he's, he's aware that he's talking to this diverse and divided congregation. And he does something very interesting with them. While that, while that letter to Ephesians is filled with illustrations and references to Jesus, when it comes to making his big point about, about kind of actualizing or, or putting all of those gifts from God to work in one's own life. He actually doesn't look to the traditions of the church, as young as they were. He doesn't look to the traditions of ancient Israel. He actually points the people of Ephesus to what would have been an everyday reminder of power and strength in their midst. 
instead of pointing them to the stories of Moses or even to the life of Jesus, to make his big point, he points them to the Roman soldiers who were in that city. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul invokes the very symbol of Rome's power, the Roman soldier, to write a parable about the provisions God offered to the faithful wherever they were to withstand the attacks on their souls, the parable of the whole armor of God. That's what Erica read for us today, and it's worth hearing again. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power, Paul writes. Put on the whole armor of God so that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand and having done everything, stand firm. Look, people of Ephesus, St. Paul seems to say, you know that Rome's soldiers are prepared and provisioned for all sorts of conflict and battle. They train to overcome every foe. Well, you as believers too must take the gifts that God gives you, the provisions that God gives you, and prepare yourself. Train your souls, train your spirits, train your hearts and your minds to do battle, but not with weapons. Paul says, for your greatest foes are unseen forces at work in this world. They're not the forces that punch you in the face. They're the forces that punch you in the heart, that mess up your mind and your thinking, that throw you off balance, that trip you up, that make you lash out in ways that you know are unbecoming, you know are wrong, but still find yourself caught up in, those, in that way nonetheless. What comes next then, as, as Paul kind of works in this way, works on this in this vein of thought, is this famous line item inventory of the blessings with which God has blessed the church. Stand therefore, he says, fasten the belt of truth around your waist, put on the breastplate of righteousness, as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When Rome tempted the faithful to acknowledge its power as the greatest force in town, the greatest force in the world, Paul, the apostle, pointed the church in a new direction. When pandemic anxiety, fraying nerves, and the weight of mental health challenges pressing down on us tempt us to give up and lash out and tear down the word of God known best in Jesus himself, steadies our steps, centers our spirits, grounds us, strengthens us, prepares us for life of service and love in this world. Paul called the church to find itself in God's promise to provide grace for the journey and strength to achieve their God-given purpose. Truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, the word of God, whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. God would give the faithful these gifts and they would not be disappointed. And when you dig into that, yeah, we can talk about truth and, and faith and salvation as these, these big topics, these big ideas. But really, when we get closer to it, what Paul's really talking about here is to engage, to engage with us as individuals, whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. What salvation means to you? What has God done in you? He, he returns us. He, he brings us back to our own faith, our own experience of God's grace at work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, and says, find in that the armor that you need, the arsenal that you need to go out and face the world and its challenges. The church of Ephesus drew strength from Paul's teaching, finding in them 
wisdom and power. Other Christians found strength in this parable too, and that's why that letter became a part of our New Testament. It's how, and it's how it is that we who have only seen Roman soldiers in history books and documentaries can still hear God speaking through these words. We've all seen power used in ways to intimidate and oppress and belittle and frighten. We've all seen communities and relationships fray. We've seen people uh, tear down rather than lift up. And we've all been bitten by rage monsters a time or two. And when we're honest, we've probably taken a bite out of a few people ourselves, haven't we? But in every time, in every place, the message to the Ephesians steers us back to Christ, brings us back to the essence of Paul's great parable. Truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, the word of God, whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. These are the gifts Christ offers to you and to me, to each one of us. And the heart that knows these gifts, that values these gifts, that meditates on these gifts, will find a spirit of renewal and hope and blessings for the journey ahead. The heart that knows these gifts, the heart so armored, will belong to Christ. And that is why we call Paul's words about the whole armor of God good news not only for ancient people, but for you and me too. Thanks be to God then for this good news today and always. Amen and amen. As we meditate on that gift today, I think we're all aware, I hope uh, through times of worship and, and through honest reflection in ourselves, we, we become aware of, of the ways each and every one of us needs that gift that God offers to us. I don't know anybody who's strong enough to, to go out and take on the world all alone, all by themselves. We need each other. We need Christ, we need hope, we need the gifts that God offers to us. It's in that spirit too that we find the connections that lead us to pray for one another, to lift up one another, to make ourselves vulnerable and honest before God in prayer. That's our invitation to be in prayer today. As the century of music uh, calls us and invites us into that deeper time of prayer, I'll remind you of how we uh, structure our prayer time here at Zoom Church, the chat function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. You can just lift up, uh, uh, include your prayer requests there. After the music, after the time of meditation, I'll share those prayer requests with, uh, with everyone here, and then we'll have uh, a time of prayer together. I'll lead us in prayer. So let us uh, go deeper now into this time of prayer. Let us lift up uh, those who are on our hearts, on our minds today. And please feel free to uh, share your prayer concerns uh, here on Zoom. Um, let's go into prayer together now. Let's now uh, take these requests that we've named and those that we hold in our hearts. Let's go to God in prayer. Would you pray with me? 
gracious and loving God, we are grateful that you've allowed us to be together on this day. Uh, we thankful, we're thankful that we now have ways to be together and to enjoy one another's presence and to enjoy your spirit's movements in our midst. We can do this in ways now that, that we'd never even heard of just two years ago. Um, but you've made a way for us and we're grateful so that on a rainy, stormy day here in the Northeast, we can still be together and, and hear of your love for us and hear of what you intend for us. And we can, we can pray and we can sing and we can lift up to you the concerns that weigh down our hearts, concerns that are very near and dear to us, close to us in proximity, the stuff of our own families, our own friendships, stuff that's it's big and history making, decisions made by nations, war and peace, earthquake and disaster. We bring it all to you. We lift it to you and pray that we would find something in words that have been spoken and sung and prayed today that would help us to bear witness to who you are and who you enable us to be as we go from worship into this world. Help us truly, as we started our service today, re remind us that everywhere we stand is sacred and holy ground, and everyone we meet is made in your image. Everyone you meet has an equal claim to your grace and your sacrifice and your love that we do, regardless of how few times they've been in a church service or how often we have been. Your grace and your love are for all. Center us in that. Ground us in that. Strengthen us in that. Bless us, gracious God. Keep us safe today and always. Keep us moving with you. Keep us serving and loving like you as we seek to be the hands and feet and the words of Christ in this world. Thanks be to God for you, for your presence, for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And now we come to the time that we set aside each week to give, to be mindful of the blessings that we have received and to offer back those gifts to God in gratitude for them. Nathan's going to place the, uh, the link to our online giving platform in the uh, chat box now. So you could click on that link and uh, make an offering there. But whatever you give today, uh, let it come from that place of gratitude. Isn't it good that we can be together like this? Isn't God's good? Isn't God's goodness uh, the, the force that's helped us through times of trial in the past? And don't we cling to the hope uh, that that grace will see us through whatever comes next? So whatever you give today, uh, give it with that spirit of gratitude. And now for a special offertory today, we're taking advantage of this chance to be together. Uh, going to our catalog of greatest hits, and uh, we'll receive an offertory today. I don't even know if Joan knows this. Joan, you're doing the offertory. Uh, <laughs> it's already done, uh, but we receive now uh, the, uh, the an offertory from uh, last summer that 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 Joan made for us uh, a, a prelude uh, on piano. Uh, let this be our offering of gratitude and thanksgiving now. Let's receive the offering and the offertory.
And now let us pray. God of power and might, through the ages you have reminded us, through prophets and apostles, that we are called to battle, not with one another, but against the powers of darkness and evil. It is this battle that sends children to bed with empty bellies, while others have so much food it damages their health. It is the battle that imprisons those whose only crime is poverty, while those with more than they could ever spend lose sleep scheming how to get more. As we make our gifts to you this day, may we walk in the light of your love. Amen. And now let us continue to pray with the confidence of God's children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Go Forth for God. Let's close our worship now as we sing together. as you go into this day, as you go to whatever the next part of this storm brings us this afternoon, whatever storm may come your way this week, go with the knowledge and the confidence that God has given you gifts to protect you, to strengthen you, to equip you, to endure, even to overcome, to go forth with joy and with love. Go then from this place to Find those gifts and to share that joy and that love with everyone you meet. Go to let your life bear witness to who Christ is and how he loves us all. Go then from this place in the name of the one revealed as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.